Hello everybody, it's Jeremy from the Head Covering Movement. Well, today I'd like to watch a video with you by Pastor Mark Driscoll. Uh, he is answering Bible questions on his YouTube channel and somebody asked him about, you know, does the Bible require women to wear a head covering? So we're going to watch his video. Usually I like playing through the entire video, but this one's a little more lengthier. It's about nine minutes and, you know, that plus my commentary would make this video way too long. So uh, let's, let's get the first two minutes, which he just gives an overview of the book of 1 Corinthians and reads the question, and we'll just interact with what he says about 1 Corinthians 11 in the topic of head covering. Um, so there's parts I agree with, parts I disagree with, but let's watch it together and uh, make some comments along the way. So let's get into that right now. 1 Corinthians 11, the real context is authority. Uh, he says that the head of Christ is God. Uh, that our head is Jesus Christ, that in a home, the husband is the head. Uh, what he's really talking about is authority and respect for God-given authority. That would include gender roles and the whole context in 1 Corinthians 11. He says, you know, man should not... Yeah, no, and this is, this is important. This is obviously what I, uh, a part I agree with. This is talking about complementarian roles, God's order and authority. Uh, and this is the foundation of head covering. This is what head covering points to, and that's why we need to take it so seriously. Paul doesn't just say, you know, in passing to do this, there's like no context. No, he grounds the symbol in God's order of authority, and that makes means we have to really take it seriously. Cover his head, woman should cover her head, man should have shorter hair, woman should, you know, let her hair grow out if that's what she wants to do, all these things. But what it's really talking Paul says that a woman's long hair is her glory. It's a special gift that God gives women. He says it is natural. Nature teaches this. So this is a part of God's order and design. So completely disagree that it's like only if a woman wants to do it. You know, that, that that's that's what we're supposed to do. And I, I get it that the Bible doesn't say how long is long. Obviously, lengths are cultural, uh, you know, but there's obviously a general principle there that women's hair should be longer than men's in whatever culture they live. So wouldn't say that it's just up to a woman. You can do it if you want. You know, that's their glory. Talking about his gender. And, and I'll just tell you, in our culture, this would be a little controversial. Um, God thinks that there are gender rules and roles that should be honored. Um, and what's happening in Corinth, much like our own culture, they're not respecting God given gender roles or even acknowledging that gender is binary and not this massive spectrum. So, uh, same conflict as we have in our cultural situation. Uh, in addition, he says, because of this and because of the angels. Well, what is that talking about? I think what he may be referring to is rebellion, dishonoring, disregarding, disrespecting the head, authority. It really started in heaven, uh, that there was God and then there were angels. And some of the angels decided, eh, we don't like authority. We want to topple authority. We want new governance. We, we want things to be different. And so they declared war against God's authority as the head in heaven. And they now are known as Satan and the demons. And what he's saying is this dishonor, disregard for authority, this lack of accepting whatever role God made you for, uh, it's nothing new. It started, you know, with the war in heaven. And when Satan and demons came down to the earth, they brought that rebellion uh, with them. That's where the Bible says that rebellion is as witchcraft. Uh, witchcraft is how we invite the demonic into our life. Rebellion is another way that we invite the demonic into our life. So whatever's happening here, there's a disregard for gender roles and there is a disregard for God-given authority. Yeah, now um, that, that's an important point. And I know it's, you know, it's, it's one that I'm going to emphasize because Paul gives a specific reason. He says in verse 10, that you do a head covering because of the angels. Now, that's, I mean, if anything, that is that is a, a, a small text where there's not a lot of detail. Paul doesn't explain what he means by that. So, you know, it, it's up to, you know, up to speculation if he means, you know, you do it because, you know, uh, you know, as a testimony against the angels or to show them proper authority or, you know, to be like them or not be like them, like be like good angels, be, not be like bad angels that fell. Ultimately, no one really knows because Paul doesn't elaborate on that topic. But the one thing he, that is important that we can say from it is Paul says, you do head covering because of the angels, not because of first century 
uh, Corinth culture, not because of temple prostitutes, not because of anything that's happening with humans in that area. You're doing it because of the angels. Now, that's that's a transcendent reason. That's a reason that would be still valid today, that'd be still valid in any other culture. So, uh, so that's one point that, you know, highly favors the the viewpoint that head covering should be still practiced today. Let's get back into the video. Those are the problems and the issues. Paul is writing as an authority to bring clarity to those who do not regard authority. And what I would say in this as well, there is a distinction in the Bible between a principle and a method. Principles are unchanging, methods are changing. As the Christian faith goes from one culture to another, what can happen is that different behaviors carry with them different meanings or values. I'll give you an example. Before he gets into this example that he's going to give, uh, first I just want to say, you know, I absolutely agree with him that there is a difference between principles um, uh, and customs uh, in Scripture. You do find both. It is the job of the theologian exegete to determine through a, a process of biblical hermeneutics, you know, uh, Sorry, I don't, I don't mean, if you're not familiar with that, it's basically, look, there is an art and a science to understanding the Bible. And there's certain rules that we follow that, you know, apply to all literature. It's not like the Bible's in a special category. There's certain ways for understanding words and, uh, and, det and determining its meaning. And so there are cultural things in the Bible. And there are things that even though that it doesn't apply in our culture, we take the meaning from it and we apply it in our uh, in our in our modern you know age or whatever culture we live in, so absolutely agree with that principle. But the fact is, is that do you treat head covering like that? Because I mean, we would all agree that there's certain things in Scripture that we don't separate the principle from uh, the custom. We, we we put them together. Baptism is one. The Lord's Supper is another. I mean, there's certain things that, that you know, you don't just do and take just the meaning and then apply it in a completely different way. And so what would be the evidence that you should approach head covering like that? Because I believe it's a Christian symbol, not a cultural symbol. I think there's good reasons for doing that, too. Not only the biblical case, the church history case, and especially the, the cultural case. Because the fact is, is that it was clearly not, you know, I don't want to say clearly. Because you know what, that's, it's a complex thing. I don't want to overstate my case. I think that the evidence is lacking for saying that that was a uh, you know, something that was clear in their in their culture that, you know, all women wore head coverings or the respectable ones. Uh, and I just don't think that that's uh, shown in the evidence. But we'll get into that more as he brings it up. Let's get back into the video. Uh, many years ago, I was in the Middle East and I went to meet, you know, someone, I think it might have been a Muslim leader, I don't remember. And I went to shake their hand, put out my right hand. And immediately, you know, my translator and tour guide said, oh, don't do that. Don't do that. I was like, well, why? In my culture, this is a way of being friendly and welcoming someone and being kind. And he said, no, no, no. In our culture, that's the hand you use after you go to the bathroom. So don't do that. You're going to offend them. I was like, oh, I, I didn't know that. In my culture, this action means something totally different in your culture. I didn't, I didn't know that. And so what happens is, as Christianity goes from one culture to another culture to another culture to another culture, the principles are timeless, but the methods are timely. I'll give you something else Paul says in the New Testament. Uh, before he goes on, you know, I just want to acknowledge the fact that, you know, that, that is a fair point in the sense that we do want to be mindful of how cultures understand things. But, but, here, but, but when do we do that? We do that for things that aren't commanded in Scripture. We do that for things that are Christian liberty or the, that, that aren't specifically spelled out, that are, we're told to do. Not everything in the Christian faith is, you know, you can just modify and fit to another culture to be non-offensive because there's many things in Scripture that are offensive. Let me, let me give you a, a, a scenario of that. Uh, that is completely legitimate. Let's just say, okay, frontier missions. Mission couple, they go off uh, into the jungle to uh, a people group who have never had the gospel preached to them before. 
So they're explaining the gospel, people are responding in faith, they're going to plant the church. Um, and, and then they're like, okay, well, you've received the faith. This is missionaries. You received the faith. Now we're going to do, we're going to baptize you. And they're like, baptism? I mean, in, in the water? I mean, that, that's what we do in our culture to the false gods. Well, I thought we, we couldn't worship any other god but Yahweh. So, so what are you going to do in that situation? Are you going to say, well, you know, okay, look, Paul, Paul wanted us to be, you know, to, to symbolize something that shows that we're united to Christ. And in their culture, it means something completely different. Um, so, you know, accounting for that, that, you know, what, let's just not do water baptism. Let's, uh, let's, let's pick something else. Let's uh, pick a new symbol that, uh, that will not have that same meaning to them. That's not what I would do. I'd say, no, no. See, baptism is a Christian symbol. We've been united on this. You know, that's in the ancient creeds. This is what we, we've been doing for 2,000 years. There's uniformity in this practice. And, and it's not just that, but the fact that this is told we're supposed to be doing this in Scripture. And so, so what, what do we do? We correct their understanding. We say, look, I know that you have associated this with false gods, but the true and living God tells us to do this. And it will be honoring to him in doing it. So we don't just abandon something just because a cultural has a visceral or reaction to it. We correct their understanding. We tell them. Now, we don't do that for things where we don't need to, of course. But, but for things that are told that we do in scripture, those we stick to. Let's get back into the video. Amen. Greet one another with a holy kiss. That's what the Bible says. But if you and I just walk into church and start kissing people, we're gonna have a lot of lawsuits and we're gonna have a lot of grief. I don't know about you, if I walk into church and people start kissing my wife, I'm probably gonna look for another church. That's just what I'm prophesying and predicting in advance. And if they came up and said, oh, but brother Mark, we're just being biblical. I'd say, well, in that culture, it meant something different than it does in our culture. There are still some cultures where when you meet somebody, they give you a kiss or kiss on the cheek and that's their warm cultural way of greeting. So the question is, how do you maintain the biblical principle with, um, with various cultural methods? It now, uh, the, the holy kiss one is, is brought very often. It's, it's uh, kind of a go-to one and understand why. I mean, it's found in the New Testament. Hardly anyone does that today. Uh, so it's, it's a good example. And I don't want to get into the should you do it or, you know, uh, is it, you know sh should you continue the practice or not. That's not the point that will detract from what I'm trying to get at. The point is, is that holy kiss in scripture. No, no. You know what? Let's, let's rewind a little. What he's saying to do is correct. We take the principle and then we apply it in our situation. For some things, not for all things. You do that for what is cultural but you don't do that for what is christian and that's the thing that's the big rub on this see a lot of the disagreements with these theologians and pastors is not on the methodology what they're doing is fun what they're doing is sound biblical hermeneutics they're just i believe applying it wrong they're applying it to something that god meant for us as the church to continue on in practice. Now, the example of holy kiss is vastly different in some areas. Paul just says, you know, tax it unto the end and greet one another with a holy kiss. There's never any defense of it. It's not like rooted in something transcendent like head covering is. And, and that's the thing is that how Paul defends head covering for 15 verses just goes in depth, grounding it in the creation order and other transcendent things such as the angels and, and gives it such weight, like this is apostolic tradition and this is in line with what nature teaches and this is uniform in practice. There's no church, he says, that has another custom. And so we got to be careful about just, just saying, oh, yeah, that's cultural. I mean, Paul says, Paul says, hey, we do this because of the angels. And we come along and say, well, Paul said to do that because of Roman culture. It's like, no, he just said because of the angels. The angels aren't cultural. And so we have to, you know, the big takeaway I'm saying is, like, the methodology is okay, but don't be so quick to apply it to anything that seems out of order in modern society. 
fact piece is that head covering was unanimously practiced by the entire church wherever it went for 1500 years. It wasn't until the Reformation where you have any divergence whatsoever. And then even from the Reformation to today, well, not today, today, but in the last hundred years, that it was still the majority practice. It's only today where it is a minority practice. And so let's not be so quick to just say, you know, because we look around and we see, hey, no one's practicing it today. It must be cultural. No, no, there's good reasons for why we why the church has always said, no, no, this is a Christian practice. This is what we do. This is proper order when we come together to worship God. Anyways, let's get back into the video. It seems like in that culture, uh, women that were prostitutes and or behaving in unacceptable ways would take their head covering off. In the, in the same way in our culture, this would be like you're married, male or female, and you go out to the club or the bar with your friends and you take your wedding ring off. You're, you're, you're communicating something. You're communicating something that is rebellious and nefarious and, and open to sin and temptation. And so what was happening in that culture was in some regard, form or fashion, what they were doing was communicating rebellion against God-given biblical principles for behavior. Okay, so this, this point here, I think this will be instructive. Actually, let me just turn back on the full screen here. Um, this is instructive because the Paul was dealing with first century, um, you know, prostitute. No, it wasn't. It was uh, the theory is, is that, okay, there was these, these women who used to be prostitutes. They converted to Christianity, but, you know, kept on some of their old ways or they were, you know, uh, or that any woman, every woman wore a head covering and any who didn't would be, you know, be, uh, would be kind of matching the practice of prostitutes. Here's the thing. Don't believe me. Don't believe Mark. If you want to know for yourself, go chase down the first firsthand primary sources. Okay, primary sources are the actual evidence that you will go to. So that would be, you know, uh, either um, archaeology, so you have paintings, you have statues, something that you've unearthed, or um, people who were writing during that time and with their words describing, you know, the practice and how people dress. Go track that down for first century prostitutes in Corinth or the Roman Empire. You're going to come up blank because really that, that's just a myth. It only is propagated in primarily modern biblical commentaries as a theory, but it, it lacks any historical support. Here's what we do find, and I do have uh, both in my book, Head Covering, A Forgotten Christian Practice for Modern Times, and in free articles on the head covering movement, where I document these sources, people with PhDs, people who are archaeologists. Uh, th the fact is, is that in that area, in Corinth, they've unearthed more public marble statues and other statues, not just marble, but uh, that of women who are appearing uncovered then covered and this is to honor them by the way these are people in high positions these are people who are who are who, who are being honored and then you also have common people as well like for example there is a uh, uh, an urn um, of a husband who is honoring his bride his wife who died young and he says on the inscription of the urn that that she was the most faithful, most loving wife. And it show, and it has a picture of her on the urn, and guess what? No head covering. So, so here's the thing, that, that contradicts the theory that, oh, anyone in that culture who didn't have a head covering, they'd be known as a prostitute. Would a husband who says his wife was the most loving, the most faithful, depict her as a prostitute? No, no, of course he wouldn't. And neither would these people in high positions appear um, in, in that way if that's the message it was communicating. So the fact is, is that it doesn't match the historical data. And uh, I, I, this might go a little long, but I think this is important, is that the main thing, I think it's the only thing, I can't remember, it's been a while since I looked into it, but the only thing that people point to is that in Corinth there was this 
uh, temple of Aphrodite where there was a thousand temple prostitutes. And, and so that's kind of where the Corinth prostitution thing happened. But the thing is, is that the source for that, Strabo, I'm not sure if I'm saying his name right, but uh, he died you know, about 25 years before Paul wrote 1 Corinthians. And uh, he went around to different places and recorded, uh, you know, travel logs of the different places he went to. And he refers to this temple, but he refers to it in the past tense. The, the, it was, see, see, Corinth was destroyed around, uh, I think it was like 146 BC by the Romans. And then it was rebuilt uh, about 100 years later. And so before or it was destroyed. So it's like 150 years before the book of 1 Corinthians. Um, that's when there was the thousand prostitutes in this big temple of Aphrodite. When it was rebuilt, it was nothing like uh, that one. He actually even says that it was small in contrast. So anyways, there's no historical evidence. Uh, mute my phone. Uh, there's no historical evidence that, you know, uh, a woman uncovered in the first century was showing that she was uh, a temple prostitute. And I think it's also important, you know, not just on that level, but what, is, what does Paul say? Does he say women only? No, no, he doesn't. He says, guess what? Also the men, the men, if they cover their heads, that that's uh, dishonoring as well. So a situation that only deals with women can't explain 1 Corinthians 11. He makes it about both genders. And so we need to take Paul's reason seriously. He says because of the angels, we say prostitutes. He's, you know, we say it's a women's situation. He says it's women and men and how they, you know, what they symbolize when they come to worship God. So those are a couple of the reasons why I disagree with that. Let's get back into the video. And so uh, for us, the question would be, It'd be helpful if we went back to Mark. There we go. If somebody sees a woman without a head covering, are they thinking the same things that they thought in that day? No, they're not. But are there certain things that men or women could do to present themselves as Christians that demonstrate a complete rebellion against authority? Like if I wore a big t-shirt that just said F authority, in our culture, that would be the way of sort of you know, demonstrating that I, I don't believe in authority. If I, if my whole life is just devoted to anarchy and rebellion, um, you know, I'm just a punk rocker to my core, and the only authority I believe is that I'm my own authority, that would be in principle against what he's articulating there in 1 Corinthians 11. So what I would say to you is, um, you know, what is the principle? The principle is to respect God-given authority. What is the method? It can vary from culture to culture. In some cultures, this principle would still hold true. In some cultures, you know, women wear head coverings, and if you don't, you're saying something that you may not want to be saying, and it all depends on the culture. In other cultures, not wearing a head covering doesn't communicate anything. Nobody thinks anything of it. And so uh, what I would say to you is I appreciate your friends studying the Bible. I appreciate them seeking to be biblical, but I think it is important to go principle method. And again, just like head coverings, I'd say greet one another with a holy kiss. That's just another example. Principle, well, how do we greet one another in a warm, affectionate, and appropriate way? The method in our culture wouldn't be kissing. It would be shaking a hand or giving a high five or maybe the knuckles, whatever that case may be. So we want to keep the biblical principle and we also want to honor a cultural method. And the truth is, sometimes if we keep the method, it actually works against the principle. It works against the principle. And so I hope that's of help. It's complicated. Uh, that is the issue in God's word. And that is the issue in Corinthians. And I would say that less clear text get interpreted in light of more clear text. We call that the principle of perspicuity. This is not the clearest text. And so other scriptures help to give us some context for this text. If you've got a question, send it in to hello at markdriscoll.org. Hopefully it's a little easier than that one. And I'll do my best to answer it for you. Okay, so I don't think that this is a perspicuity issue. I, I understand, you know, what he's saying that, of course, it is a correct biblical uh, hermeneutics um, principle that if there are two texts, you know, or multiple texts, and that one seems to be contradictory to the other, you always interpret the clear in light of the less clear true principle. But the fact is, is that there is nothing that actually contradicts this uh, at all. So uh, that's not really the issue. This is, this is 
uh, a topic that is dealt with only once in the New Testament, but don't let that one time, uh, you know, make it sound like it's not important because uh, the length and the vigor that Paul goes through in defending it, 15 verses, five different reasons, you know, rooting it, like I said, in the creation order and angels and all these big, hard to overturn, like you can't just take that lightly uh, in, in how he um, defends this symbol. So I understand, Mark understands this as a cultural symbol where you take the you take the principle and you can leave behind the symbol. I say that that this is a new covenant Christian symbol. It means they didn't, they didn't practice this in Genesis or under Moses. This is for those who are in the new covenant, um, and it is for all cultures, all times that when praying and prophesying. I understand that to be uh, when we're gathered together as a church to worship God. Some people understand it as, as more. That's okay. That's not what this is about. But when we're at the very least, when we're gathered together to worship God corporately, that women should cover their heads. Men should not have something on their heads. And that visually communicated, communicates to the angels, not to the cultural around, culture around you, but to the angels and those gathered that you accept God's role and authority for you. And that, uh, you know, that, that to me is a beautiful thing. It's not something that we should be, you know, just, just quickly leaving behind. If a culture is misunderstanding this, then the culture and of course, when I say the culture, I'm not actually referring to people outside the church. I'm really talking to the church because it's for the church and for the angels. And so they would need to be retaught and taught what it means as a Christian when we do this. We're communicating something beautiful. This is a visual picture that God wants us to do. And it wasn't just for Corinth, but as Paul said in verse 16, that there is no other church. All churches practice this custom. The, the antecedent to um, when he says that we have no such custom comes from verse 13 where it talks about women praying uncovered. That means that it was, it was something that was done in uniform practice. Not just the Corinthian church had their women covered. All the churches that Paul knew about, that he had planted, all practice this symbol. We're the exception, and that needs to change. So if you'd like to study this more, you can head on over to headcoverymovement.com slash study for our free study guide of this passage. Uh, and uh, you could also get my book at christianheadcovering.com. It's called Head Covering a Forgotten Christian Practice uh, for Modern Times. Thank you.